you're very, very welcome to Grant Thornton's offices this morning for our international tax update for investment funds. For any of you who don't know me, my name's Neve Meenan and I head up financial services in Grant Thornton. Uh, we've run this seminar now for several years and it always proves to be a popular and timely event. Uh, there's something about tax that gets people interested. And it's certainly true that keeping up with changes in international tax, both for the funds and the investors, is a challenge. But it's also a key part of us maintaining Ireland's reputation as a centre for excellence for servicing Irish and offshore funds. And our speakers today bring a wealth of international expertise to us. Um, we start off with Paul Beesey, who makes a welcome return from Grant Thornton in Boston. Paul is a tax partner there who specialises in financial services and also a host of transactions where there is um, any kind of cross-border element. Uh, Paul will be followed by uh, Peter Vale, who's a tax partner here in Grand Sorrent in Dublin. Again, Peter is, uh, has many years experience in financial services and also in a lot of international transactions and has a range of international clients. And finally, we've Anne Stopford, who's head of uh, funds tax in Grand Thornton in London. Anne is a member of the AIM at Tax Committee and is also a regular visitor here uh, in Dublin. She has a wide client range, both of funds and of investment managers. And all of our speakers today are very experienced in providing tax advisory and compliance services to funds that are administered here. Um, given the, uh, the popularity of the US and the UK, for funds with, with the fund managers being resident there, we find that working very closely with our associates there is a key part of our work here. Um, but what I want to talk about is the, um, the UK reporting fund regime and um, there haven't really been any major developments in terms of legislation during the year, I mean there have been some, but what we have got is a lot more practical experience coming down the line because um, these rules, as you'll probably be aware, were introduced um, 2009, 1st of December 2009, but they had very long transitional provisions uh, um, introduced at the same time. So uh, in many cases, or in some cases, funds still haven't gone into the reporting fund regime. In other cases, um, they are in there, but we've only really in the last few months actually been having to prepare reporting fund uh, calculations. And it, there's some practical aspects that are coming out as a result of that, and it's, it's those types of things that I wanted to, to pick up on. I'll say I'm going to to, to run through some of these slides, but um, just, just standing back and just a reminder in terms of the offshore funds re legislation and why it's there and, and what's happened. Um, this legislation has been around since 1985, um, so quite some time now, and is designed to stop UK taxpayers rolling up income by investing in off offshore funds and then generating a capital gain on disposal. So the intention is that provided the fund has the sort of special designation either as distributor funds under the old rules or now under reporting fund rules, capital gains will be taxed as capital gains rather than income, um, but investors are taxed on, a, on an annual basis on the, any income arising. C clearly, we, we have seen a huge increase in the number of funds that are actually going into this, this regime compared to the old regime. And uh, one of the drivers really for that is the... Um, the differential in tax rates. So Peter mentioned about the differential in tax rates here. We've got similar differential in, in the UK in that if, if an investor invests in an offshore fund, um, if it's outside the offshore funds regime, then it is taxed as capital gain. Uh, and that is an area where there have been changes uh, as a result of this legislation because the definition itself has changed. And it is always important if you've got an investor investing in an offshore fund to see whether it does fall within, within the regime or not, but if we're talking about open-ended funds, use it, it will definitely fall within this regime. If it is in, if, if it is in the regime, if, if the fund uh, applies uh, uh, to be a reporting fund and complies with relevant uh, conditions, then any capital gains on exit for investors, for individuals, are taxed at a top rate of 28% versus a non-reporting fund where uh, investors are taxed potentially at the top rate of 50%. So there's a huge differential, and that, that really has been a, a big driver. But investors do need to be aware that the counter to that is that they will be taxed on the annual income of the fund. And the difference between the, the current regime and the, the old distributor status regime is that they will be taxed on any income, whether it's received or not. So there is the capacity there for, for dry income. Uh, and investors need to be aware of that. And also, uh, another difference is that the fund has to report 100% of the income, whereas under the old rules it was 85%. So you know, potentially there could be um, more income 
be being taxed uh, for investors. In terms of corporate investors, if we're talking about a pure corporate, they're unlikely necessarily to be, to be too concerned, really, because the uh, income and, and capital gains tax rates for corporates are broadly aligned. There's a few small differences. However, if we're looking at UK funds uh, investing in offshore funds, then there is a big difference because UK funds are exempt from tax on capital gains, whereas they pay tax at 20% on, on income if we're look, looking at authorised funds, and it's the normal corporation tax rate of 26% if we're looking at an investment trust. And what we have seen over the last few years is, is undoubtedly a much, uh, many more UK funds investing in offshore funds. They're trying to diversify more and, and give, get different exposure. And this actually is a big issue when we're looking at it from a UK tax perspective um, as to whether funds uh, have invest, whether UK funds are invested in reporting funds or non-reporting funds. I mentioned about the transitional rules, and the, the, the rules came in from 1st of December 2009, uh, but there was an option for uh, <coughs> funds to apply for distributor status for the subsequent period as well. So, for example, if we had December 2009, that fell under the distributor status rules. Dece December 2010, they could go into the reporting fund rules, but equally they could do distributor status which is why for an awful lot of funds, if we take December as being the sort of fa fairly um, popular year end, an awful lot of funds, it's really only December 11 that they're actually in the regime. There were a number of funds that, that went in for December 10, <coughs> but, uh, and, and, and it's those ones that we've been working on in, in, in recent months. But for, as I say, for a lot, it, uh, it, it's really only this coming year where they'll be looking at it for the first time. If we look at um, a, a fund with a year ended 30th of September, um, it may well be that they've continued to apply for distributor status uh, for uh, the year to 30th of September 2011, and it's only from literally now, 1st of o October 2011, that they're actually going to be going into to the regime. So 30th of September 2012 will be their first year. So this whole process has meant we've got funds, depending on their year end and depending on what they've actually decided to do, are within, within so all, all different so states of um, implementation of the reporting fund rules. Just to recap uh, in terms of the process, it's really two stages. First of all is the advanced application and then subsequently actually doing the reporting fund um, calculations. And the advanced application itself is relatively straightforward and it's quite clear from the legislation what needs to be included in the application <coughs> to the revenue. Then there is a form that, um, that, that a specific form that needs to be completed and set out there what, what actually needs to be covered in that. The point to bear in mind is that the deadline for submission used to be, uh, until May this year, used to be three months after the start of the accounting period, whereas now that has been deferred. So now funds have up to the end of the first accounting period for which they want to go into the regime to, to make the application. So it gives a, a, a bit more time uh, to make that decision. Or if you've got a, a new share class, is within three months after those shares are made available to UK investors. So, for example, if you've got a new fund that, that's launched at the beginning of the year, but you've got a new share class that's launched just one month before the year end, you've got until two months after the year end to, to apply. But the important point on this is that the application needs to be made for individual sub-funds and individual share classes within those sub-funds, and each one needs to be specified uh, and so if you have got new share classes, those need to be, separate applications do need to be made. In terms of the ongoing requirements, again, it's very specific in terms of what, what's actually needed, but the change over the distributor status is it's, it is very much more uh, dependent on the accounting income, the accounts being the starting point, uh, and making adjustments to, to those accounts. A computation of reportable income needs to be prepared, and that needs to be um, submitted to, to the revenue, and also there's a requirement to submit uh, uh, specific information to, to investors as well. So in terms of the, the provision of information to, to investors or participants, um, that needs to be done within six months of the year end. And in practice, that is probably it's bound to be the case because it's the first year. Um, that, that is something that has caused a uh, problem in terms of actually getting, not <coughs> problem, but it's a number that have been right up to the end of the, the six month period just being clear about what needs to be presented, how it needs to be presented. There's a variety of different ways. It could be by way of post or email, published on the website, or indeed in a UK newspaper, although I'm not aware of anyone who's done that as yet. Um, and it's actually being cl clear up front the way that the, the process is going to be used. Uh, and in practice, we found, as I say, that there's a variety. 
Um, some managers, for example, some funds have only got a relatively few number of investors and they've just sent them specific letters. Others have put it on the <coughs> website. But there needs to be, it needs to be accessible to investors. It needs to be accessible to the revenue as well uh, because they, they need to be able to, to see that the information has been provided to, to, to the investors. I'm going to pick up a, a, in a moment on some of the, the, sort of the practical issues that we've, we've come, against, uh, come up against. But I'll say that it's, it's quite clear in terms of the... Um, the basis of calculating reportable income is based on the accounts with certain specific adjustments. Um, I, I, always sort of, I always think it's ir ironic in a way that the revenue brought out the consultation originally to try and make this whole process more simple. But it, to be honest, it's, <laughs> it's anything but in terms of um, the, the amount of adjustments and, and the like that need to be considered. So in terms of the practical aspects, um, one of the key... Uh, drivers, actually, I suppose, but also key considerations is whether the fund is, is trading or whether it's an investment fund. And the revenues view has changed, and it, it, the, the revenue have really um, mm -hmm. softened their view in relation to whether a fund could be considered to be trading or, or, or investing. And, and the concern is that if it's considered to be trading, then any gains arising from those trades are treated as income and they have to be treated as reportable income uh, to, to investors, which clearly would be um, disadvantageous because uh, investors would then be taxed on, on something before they actually realise it and taxed at income tax rates. But we have now got certainty, um, provided uh, two conditions are, are, comp are complied with. First of all, the equivalence condition, and secondly, secondly genuine diversity of ownership. And provided those conditions are satisfied, then... Um, there is a what's called a whitelist which sets out the uh, number of different types of transactions. <coughs> Provided those transactions are, um, um, are what's been done within the fund, then it will definitely be treated as investment rather than trading. So that in itself is a very, very useful, um, uh, it gives certainty to investors. If we're looking at USITS funds, they would, be, they would be covered by this, provided they satisfy the genuine diversity of ownership condition. So if you had a fund, for example, that was aimed at a very narrow category of investors or as a family-type fund, a private investor fund, those would not satisfy the, these conditions. Um, but if it's open to a wide range of investors and various conditions are satisfied, then the, there's certainty there, which is helpful. This, this um, condition was amended in the legislation that came out in May this year to extend it, to extend it slightly to... Um, uh, EEA funds uh, where they're marketed to retail and, and professional investors where there's specific borrowing and um, uh, derivative contract exposure limits. This is something that, that has been discussed with the revenue quite a lot over the, the last year or so because particularly if we're looking at hedge funds, um, there's a concern that hedge funds haven't got this, this, uh, sim this similar certainty, uh, but the revenue are refusing to, to budge on that particular point. Um, Therefore, we're then back into first principles as to whether the fund could be trading or not. Um, as I said earlier, the revenue <coughs> view, I think, has softened a bit, but it, it really is still necessary to look to see whether there is a trading argument there, whether the fund is turning over the portfolio very, very frequently, what's the motive when it's uh, um, t um, buying and selling investments, etc. So certainly there are certain funds I've, I've looked at over the last year where I've advised that it's, it really is there's a, a very strong risk that it could be trading and it's probably not uh, beneficial for, for them to go into the reporting fund rules. However, there are an awful lot of other hedge funds, but when you look at it, there's really a strong argument that it's not trading, it's investing. And I think this is another driver for um, many more funds going to this regime than, than previously, along with the need, or no longer the need, to actually physically distribute. So certainly in the hedge fund space, we're seeing an awful lot more going into this regime. Effective interest um, is another uh, potential issue um, because under the reporting fund regime, and, and in fairness, it's the same under the um, distributor status <coughs> regime as well, uh, loan, uh, loan investments, loan relationship investments, debt investments had to be accounted for under the effective interest uh, regime as uh, prescribed under the IMA SORP. So effectively what they're saying is, well, you would look at this investment, how would be how would it be treated if it was a, um, accounted for by a UK fund? And um, what the revenue are looking for here is um, an effective interest method, which effectively apportions any, any discount over the life of the bond. But what the reporting fund rules do say is that 
um, if it's not if it's not accounted for under the effective yield method, if they do, it doesn't, it's not prescribed to be um, under the IMA uh, under the IMA SORP, but there must be an equivalent method, and and that, and that in itself does allow some flexibility, and, and indeed under the IMA SORP as well, there's some flexibility. There's an element of subjectivity in terms of how you go about calculating the effective interest uh, uh, rate and what needs to be accounted for as, as, as income and, and therefore reported. And I think it is something that needs to be looked at on a case-by-case on a -case basis and, and really just come up with a view as to, to what would be a, an acceptable method um, for, for accounting for these, these bonds. One interesting thing, and we've seen this coming up a few times, is the treatment of index-linked bonds. And of course, with the, the rate of the, the movements in inflation over the last year or so, um, this potentially is quite, uh, quite a, a headache in terms of the amount that would need to be reflected as income. And I've got this on one particular client at the moment where um, the, the adjustments would be really significant. They're faced with reporting an awful lot to, to, to their investors. Um, and in fact, this is something I was hoping to get an answer from the revenue before, uh, before coming over um, uh, to, to today. But um, in the UK, there are different rules for applying uh, that apply for index-linked bonds to allow for the index ele indexation element not to be distributed. And actually also in the tax regime, there are specific provisions applying to UK uh, gilts. Um, and I've actually I posed that question, I'm waiting for an answer, because at the moment we have got a differential between UK funds and offshore funds, which the, the attention of these uh, regulations is very much to, to align these. Derivatives, the, the similar questions on derivatives, making sure that the, the treatment of derivatives mirrors the treatment under the IMA SORP, and to the extent that anything is taken to capital, you can ignore that for the purposes of reported, reportable income, but to the extent that it would have to be accounted for under the IMA SORP as revenue, then you'd have to bring it in and, and report it. Now, the, one, one big issue uh, was caused some concern over the last year, and, and has been changed as a result of discussions with the revenue, is the question of equ income equalisation. And I know when, when these rules first came out, there really was a concern that the way the rules are drafted uh, and the fact that income is essentially allocated only to those investors who are in the fund at the year end, there is really a concern, a genuine concern in some cases, that um, there would be what's called the last man standing issue, that the poor guys who are left in at the year end would be allocated the income and those investors who went out during the course of the year, particularly if, if equalisation wasn't operated, would, would get away without having in, any income allocated. And as I say, it was a subject to a, an awful lot of discussion. And what has resulted is um, the fact that funds can have the choice as to, to what they do. Now, it may well be that funds operate um, income equalization in the accounts. And um, if that's the case, there are specific provisions to allow for that equalization to be adjusted when calculating reportable income. But, but my, my experience, certainly with doing um, funds that administered in Dublin, and it's not necessarily, um, I'm sure not necessarily all, always the case, is it, but um, equalisation is, is perhaps rarely um, operated in practice, and therefore it was those sort of situations which really could end up with a, with a problem. So for funds that don't operate equalisation, there's now three options. One is to effectively do the reportable income calculations um, on a basis that, that in effect, re uh, recognises equalisation. And the way it does that is to, uh, rather than dividing it by the reportable income by a number of units at the year end, it's calculating on an average basis, uh, average units basis. And it can be done on either a reported income basis or an accounting income basis. This is going to get horribly, horribly complicated, so I won't go into the detail. Um, but essentially, um, it's allowing... Um, but, and those calculations have to be done based on what they call the computation period. So if a fund accumulates or distributes every month, for example, you'd have to do 12 calculations and, and split it up in that way. Um, you can do it based on reporting or accounting income, whichever is, is more straightforward. But if you do it on an accounting income, you can only use it where the difference between doing it on accounting income and reported income would be less than 10%, which always seems strange to me because you've got to you've got to actually effectively go through the, those, those two sets of calculations. And say it has to be done for computation periods. So if you've got a fund that, that doesn't distribute, say, monthly or quarterly or whatever, and it's just once a year, it's probably not too difficult to do this, provided you can work out the, number, the average number of units, etc. Um, but for others, it may be more complicated. And there really is a decision to be taken as to whether you actually want to, to do these calculations 
or not. And, and one option is to do nothing. Um, in the draft regs that came out, it was going to be mandatory to do something. Now, now you, don't, um, you don't have to do anything. However, if you don't want to do any equalisation adjustments, you've actually got to elect not to do it. And I think that's quite an important point, uh, at least to, to consider, because um, if you don't elect, then you are the, the, the default is that you do your calculations based on reported income um, under these equalisation uh, arrangements. And for funds that are going into the regime now, you have to include that in your application as to what you're actually going to do. For funds that were, were in the regime before these provisions came in place, there is a transitional period and they have until 27th of Mar May 2012 to make that election. And um, so that's a point just to, to watch out for and to consider. In practice, I have to say the ones we've looked at have so far decided to do nothing, and that's mainly because either they've got no reportable income or very small amounts of reportable income, or they feel that their investor base is really quite stable and they're not concerned about the last man standing issue. The other um, practical point that we come across a lot is, um, and this is probably the, the most difficult area, I think, uh, in, in practice, is, is the funds investing in other offshore funds. And uh, this has been opened up, really, because of the abolition of the 5% investment restriction that came in with the, the reporting fund rules, and that, that was clearly very good news. But what we do need to do now is drill down to the extent that the reporting fund has investments in other offshore funds, work out whether the underlying funds are reporting funds, whether they're distributing funds, uh, or whether they're non-reporting funds. And, and it, for reporting funds, for example, we have to pick up the underlying reported income. Um, for non-reporting funds, there is a choice. Um, either if it's possible to obtain sufficient information to effectively do those calculations yourself, then you can bring in the notional reportable income into the calculations of the reporting fund. In practice, though, unless the fund is an in-house fund, it's very difficult to get that information. Um, but clearly, that, that may be, that, that's an option. If you don't do that, then the other, um, the other position is you have to account for this non-reporting fund on a fair value basis. So essentially what you're doing is bringing in the unrealized capital gain on an annual basis and treating that as income. So that could really be quite distorting. If you've got a fund that's in a reporting fund investing in a non-reporting fund, that could have a, a big effect on reportable income, which is why it's important right up front to understand, or managers particularly, to understand exactly what they're investing in because it could inha have an impact on their, 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 their fund position. Transparent funds. Transparent funds are, in theory, outside of these rules, provided they undertake to... Uh, provide information to investors to enable them to complete their tax <coughs> returns, and provided they meet the five percent restriction on investments in non-reporting funds. What we have found, though, is a number of transparent funds are actually applying for reporting fund status. It's partly because if they're going to have to provide the information in some form anyway, they might as well do it as a, under the reporting fund regime. It means they don't have to worry about the five percent restriction. But perhaps, probably more importantly, is this whole reporting fund regime is is being seen really as, as quite a marketing tool. The fund has reporting fund status, is seen as beneficial for either UK investors or other funds who are looking to invest in reporting funds. So as I say, we're seeing quite a lot of uh, funds uh, going into the, to the regime. So really, as I say, not a huge amount in, t in terms of change, but what we are um, finding is there are practical issues that need to be uh, borne in mind, but also we're still in this process of funds being at various different stages, and it's important to make sure the deadlines that, that apply to under the old rules and the new rules uh, are adhered to, particularly, for example, new share classes. It's all very well thinking, well, this fund's a reporting fund, but you've got a new share class that has to be separately applied for. <coughs> the other point um, to pick up on is um, for funds going to the reporting fund regime for the first time, it is also worth thinking about whether they could apply for distributor, distributor status retrospectively, and the revenue is still accepting late applications for distributor status. And it is worth, worth sort of to standing back and seeing whether, A, a that might be beneficial or uh, w whether it's possible in this case. That's all I wanted to say on reporting funds. I, I did want to just literally do a, a quick um, uh, advertisement, if I may, for uh, another area. We're coming back in uh, a month's time, actually, to talk about 
probably the hottest topic around at the moment, which is FATCA. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure everyone in this room, when you hear that word, sort of shudders, really. And that's uh, how a lot of us feel, I think, I think generally. But uh, the important, I'm sure you're all aware, that uh, as it stands at the moment, um, that there's a 30% withholding tax that, that could apply to um, both income and proceeds are on disposal to a non-US financial institution unless the, that institution uh, enters into a FATCA agreement. Now, there's been a lot, a lot uh, in the press about the deferral of the, the FATCA rules, and uh, indeed, the deferral is, is on the face of it very good in terms of the, the actual withholding tax is not going to apply to 2014 or 2015, which sounds an awful long way off. Um, and there has also been a deferral in terms of the actual entry date or when FATCA agreements or FFI agreements need to be in place. That's been deferred until 30th of June 2013. But that agreement has to be in place by that date. <coughs> Clearly, there, there's, um, it needs to be submitted beforehand and, and agreed with the IRS. But more importantly, there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done uh, before that to get to that stage to look at how these rules could impact. And we're all working in a situation where uh, the regulations aren't final. We have, we're waiting for another draft set of regulations before the end of this year and then final draft, so middle of next year. <coughs> but working back, there, there's, a, there's an awful lot to do. So uh, we're planning to, to run a series of three seminars um, in mid-November, really to focus on, on FATCA. And I wanted to raise it because you know, reporting funds is, is a big <coughs> issue um, from, from a UK perspective when we're looking at, looking at funds, but probably the biggest issue at the moment is, is FATCA. And uh, say we, we're going to debate a, ho a whole session to that. So, over to you, Peter. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Amelia and Anne, for that. I'd just like to thank Paul and Anne for for coming over and giving such insightful thoughts on two very interesting um, topics. And thank you very much for for coming. <coughs> thanks, guys. Thank you.